Canadians are living longer. That's the good news. The bad news? Not all of us will have the money necessary to see us through retirement. Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. Tax rules regarding registered retirement income funds need revamping to ensure that they reflect updated demographic and economic realities. Meet Bill Robson. He's the CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. In his 16 years with Canada's most respected think tank, he's written more than 250 articles, intelligence memos, and books on subjects ranging from government budgets, pensions, and healthcare financing to inflation and currencies. He is the co-author of Live Long and Prosper, Mandatory RRIF Drawdowns Raise the Risk of Outliving Tax-Deferred Saving. He joins us now. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, it's a, I wish it were a more cheerful topic, but uh, there are ways out of this. Well, let's begin by understanding the demographic and economic realities facing Canadians, turning their registered retirement savings plans into RIFs. We have a massive cohort of Canadians entering their golden years. Well, we do. I think that many of us, uh, for a long time, both in thinking about our personal finances and when it comes to the, the financial industry and the advice we get have been focusing very much on accumulation. Uh, when it comes time to convert your savings uh, into income in retirement, uh, you encounter some problems that up till now haven't been front and center for as many people as is going to be true in the future. And one of the things that we're looking at in this paper is how returns on safe assets, the sort of thing that is appropriate for an older person to own. So conservative things, bonds, uh, not so much cryptocurrency or, uh, uh, you know, natural gas futures, how the returns on those things have, have come down in real terms. Uh, and at the same time, as you mentioned on the way in, people are living longer. And when you combine those two facts with the tax rules around how quickly you have to draw your funds down, uh, you end up in a situation where an appreciable number of people, especially women, are likely to get to an advanced age with far less purchasing power from these uh, funds they've been saving than they probably thought they were going to have. And how has the 2008 financial crisis and the fallout from COVID-19 impacted this demographic? Well, what has happened on the two occasions you mentioned is that there was enough uh, pressure from holders of, of RIFs and similar types of accounts uh, to to um, uh, get some relief from the requirement that they otherwise would have to withdraw a set percentage of their funds. Um, and the reason for the distress there was that the market was way down. And if you're forced to liquidate when the market is way down, uh, you're you're going to suffer a permanent loss. The key thing about these accounts is that you're not able to put money into them anymore. Once you've converted and you start to draw down, uh, you're on that uh, drawdown schedule. So at times of extreme market distress, the government did acknowledge, I don't think very adequately, but nevertheless, there was a, a reduction in this required minimum drawdown. It lasted for one year. Uh, and to our way of thinking, uh, Alex Loran and I, as we were looking at the situation, uh, we thought, okay, so they've acknowledged that there is a problem under those specific circumstances, uh, but what about the more chronic problem that exists where returns are lower, people are living longer, and the way that these funds are set up right now, if you make it to your mid-90s, which more and more people are doing, uh, you're going to be forced to draw them down very precipitously, which leaves you with very little purchasing power, and also... Uh, one other thing that I think is important to just get out there is lots of people, by the time they're in their mid-1990s, I mean, we're all, as we record this, uh, people are struggling with their tax forms in the prime of life. Uh, by the time you're in your mid-90s, a lot of these financial decisions are harder to make, uh, and it's a bit of a risky time of life for somebody to be forcing you to draw down your savings uh, and 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 increasing your anxiety about not having uh, enough money to see yourself out with. So then let's talk about what the mandatory minimum withdrawals currently look like. What they have done is they've established a formula that is uh, essentially geared to uh, how how old you are, uh, such that you're drawing down a, per, a set percentage of your savings each year uh, until you get to your 90s, at which point it, 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 it accelerates to 20% a year. I mean, it really is designed to run the thing down to virtually nothing over a short space of time if you make it that far. Uh, the reason that we have a formula like that 
uh, is is partly just because the government wants you to withdraw the money so they can tax you. Uh, it it the the original concept here, though, uh, back when returns were higher, was that if you did draw the money down according to that schedule through to your mid nineties, you'd have roughly equivalent purchasing power over time. So a person who took that drawdown schedule and said, this is kind of what the government thinks I should do, and took the money out and spent it at that rate, would actually not be in a lot of trouble. I mean, until you got it to your, your, your later 90s, but back when these rules were first put in place, far fewer people did that. So the idea was kind of have a a, a more or less level purchasing power. Well, that worked when real interest rates were very high. This all goes back to the um, uh, early 90s. Um, but nowadays, the same pattern of withdrawals uh, results in uh, purchasing power that falls off quite appreciably even before you get to your late 1990s. So the formula that made some kind of sense uh, when it was originally put in place simply doesn't make sense now. I'll add there was one change made in 2015. Uh, the minimum withdrawals did get smaller then. They got less onerous, um, but it wasn't enough to make up the difference. You're still in a situation today compared to when they first set this regime up uh, where you're getting a, a, a very pronounced diminution of your purchasing power o over time. Uh, which is a distressing situation for a senior to be in, and it's entirely unnecessary. The government's impatient for the revenue. The government's immortal. What does the timing matter to them? To the retiree, it certainly matters because we're mortal, and so you don't want to run out of money before you're done. You mentioned that the government wants to tax us. Uh, let's talk a little bit more uh, about that because you've you've written it as you know the the minimum withdrawal rules are, are essentially uh, the government is is looking for its 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 peace. The government impatience for revenue, I think, is the way you describe it. I can't imagine the tax revenue is significant enough to risk running a Canadian dry. How significant is it? Well, we don't know what the tax implications would be of simply, suppose you simply uh, abolished the requirement altogether. A lot of people would continue to draw the money down. I mean, that's what it's there for. Uh, so that's that's why we say for, you know, the, the idea that everybody is just going to hoard like crazy and then and then pass it on to their uh, their heirs. Um it doesn't really make a, a lot of sense. And of course, if it's not to somebody, if it's not to a spouse or somebody that you can transfer to on a tax-free basis, it's going to get taxed then anyway. Um, the, the way to frame it, I suppose, in a way that's sympathetic to the government would be to say that the ability to defer taxes on this type of saving in your RRSP or in a pension plan is a bit of a concession that the government makes in order to make it easier for you to save for retirement. I'd argue it's good tax policy uh, to begin with, not the double tax saving. But if you frame it that way, you'd say, okay, well, having received that tax concession, the government wants to make sure that you use it for the purpose that it was designed for, which is to uh, get the income in retirement and, and, then, uh, and then deplete it over time so that by the time you die, you've used up your tax deferred savings. So that's my sympathetic way of framing it. Um, one of the obvious problems with that sort of approach is that you're going to have a one-size-fits-all situation. Some people uh, are not going to live very long after retirement. Some people are going to live a long time. Some people may have big uh, financial requirements in their early retirement years when they're very active, but then they'll spend less money over time. Others are going to need a lot of money toward the end because many of us will need special kinds of health care, uh, adaptations around the home, uh, that type of thing. So one size does not fit all. And it's a bit of a problem with this uh, withdrawal formula that it really does force everybody into the same mold. So I want to get out there uh, the radical seeming idea that we could simply uh, do away with uh, uh, the minimum drawdowns. And in fact, while you're at it, why have the forced conversion at age 71 in the first place? Uh, that age should certainly be higher, but there's actually a respectable argument for simply not having it. What if somebody goes back to work uh, at age 70, uh, after age 71, as some people do, or keeps working and wants to continue accumulating? Why shouldn't they? That person might live past age 100. So there's a pretty good case to make for simply abolishing all these restrictions. It would certainly make life simpler. Uh, but if the government can't quite get itself to doing that, and if a, there's a lot of populist pressure saying, oh, it's a tax break for people who have tax deferred saving in the first place, let's just make the drawdown requirements less stringent. 
and 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 alleviate that pressure on people who are getting into their 90s and are going, hey, wait a second, I, I've got a lot of years ahead of me and I've run my money down. You mentioned the idea of, of living to 100. There was a time when that was a crazy idea, certainly not anymore, since uh, RIPs were introduced in 78. Life expectancy in 1978, I believe, was about 75. We revised the rules in 1992. Uh, the average life expectancy then was about 78. And then, as you point out, in 2008 and again in 2015, uh, we made some changes and uh, it's tweaks when COVID hit. Today, life expectancy is 83. What kind of rule changes do we need to make to accommodate the prospect of not just an 83-year-old, but possibly a 100-year-old? Well, the first thing, I'll go back to the point uh, about the age at which you have to stop saving in tax-deferred accounts and start drawing down. Uh, That has never changed since it was first put in place. And when it was first put in place, uh, life expectancy was shorter and and, and fewer people were thinking about working past that age. Uh, now people are living longer. Uh, COVID made a change to that. We've had, you know, you always want to keep up to date with where we are on longevity. Um, but my guess about what we're going to see as we get past the impact of the pandemic is that many of the factors that cause people to live longer and healthier lives are still in place. Uh, and and so this trend that we've seen over time is going to continue. So raise those ages. Uh, if they had kept pace with the change in life expectancy at age 71, uh, they would be at least three years higher now than they were. Uh, and so that would postpone the whole time at which you, uh, you know, hit this wall where you've got to stop saving in your RRSP and then start drawing it down the next year. Uh, those, those ages should be higher. The other thing that I would recommend is that we look uh, very hard at this requirement that you start drawing down a 20% per year when you get into your 90s. Uh, why have that sudden acceleration off a cliff? It's a terrible time of life to force somebody into uh, an elaborate change in their financial arrangements. Uh, and, and there's no reason to do it because now uh, we do have people, uh, especially women, some people would emphasize that you know, there's a difference among this, between the sexes and how this affects people. Um, they're living a lot longer, and uh, there's simply no reason not to adapt the overall schedule, both both when you have to stop saving and start drawing down, and then when those drawdowns accelerate. Uh, we should be accommodating the increase in life expectancy. What role does inflation play in your concerns? You, you've written that too many seniors will live long enough to see the purchasing power of their tax-deferred savings dwindle to insignificance. Well, one of the things that would have been nice, and in fact, I would argue for it now as a bit of a patch up, is to uh, have some acknowledgement in the current schedule uh, that people who have their money in safe investments, uh, such as government bonds, uh, took a bit of a hosing. So in nominal terms, they're they're safe in the sense that you're going to get your coupon. Uh, It's backed by if you're if you're owning government bonds. Uh, you're in about as safe an investment as there can be, but inflation hits all that. Uh, and and so that would have been a pretty good reason to have an accommodation uh, right now so that people weren't forced to draw down so much and they could kind of maintain their purchasing power. Uh, if you go back to the schedule when it was initially set up uh, with, with, the, with the current rules, uh, the idea was that there could be some nominal appreciation. So looking aside from inflation, uh, you, you'd have some kind of nominal appreciation in your portfolio. The drawdowns were deliberately small enough uh, that uh, there would be a little bit of uh, an offset to potential inflation. Uh, and so uh, that that made a lot of sense. It, nowadays, even with the Bank of Canada likely, uh, as I think it is, to get inflation back down to 2%, uh, that is an erosion of purchasing power on a nominal amount that's already falling. So it really does increase the uh, urgency that uh, I think people feel when they're watching the value of their money go down. Let me please, uh, since you mentioned inflation and protection of inflation, I think that uh, which if you look at the pension plans that federal public servants have, the pension plans that MPs have, they're indexed to inflation. It's a lifetime annuity. It'll get paid till the day you die. It's guaranteed by the government. And, and inflation doesn't affect you. So if you think of what the real purchasing power of that looks like over time, it's actually, I mean, they're fairly generous pensions, but the point is it's a, it's a level payment in real terms throughout your life. 
Uh, and when the RIF rules were originally put in place, at least until people got into their 90s, it kind of approximated that. It was going to be a fairly level payment in real terms. Now, it falls off a cliff. It, it, it goes down very sharply in real terms. One of the interesting thought experiments is, suppose I was designing a, a defined benefit pension plan uh, for public servants or for anybody else. And I said, here's what the payments are going to look like in retirement. In real terms, they're going to go down and down and down and down and down. And then they're going to drop uh, precipitously when you're in your 1990s. People would say, why would I want a pension like that? Nobody wants a pension like that. And yet that's what the RIF rules effectively put in place. So you built models for what the rules meant in 92, 2014, the revised 2015 rules, what it all means for us today. What does the model tell us about someone in this position today? Well, if you if you go back to when the regime was first put in place, the chances that uh, somebody would live long enough uh, to uh, of either sex, uh, the chances somebody would live long enough to see the value of their tax deferred nest egg drop, say, below 10% of its original value, they were negligible. It, it really affected hardly anybody. Uh, but now we're looking at a situation where appreciable numbers of people uh, will see the value of their nest egg certainly fall by half, uh, fall by three quarters, even fall by 90% to that 10% threshold I talked I talked about. It's a material thing. And so if the uh, intent behind the original proposals was to make it be like a, a one in a thousand chance that you were going to be in that situation, uh, let's get the uh, age limits and the withdrawal rules uh, back to the point where it's a negligible thing and people do not have what has now become quite a material chance about living their savings. You point out that annual income is a defective basis for assessing liability for taxes and eligibility for transfers to begin with, since people with similar lifetime incomes often have different earnings patterns that expose them to higher or lower average tax rates. Yes, this is a, 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 a problem that affects the tax system quite generally. We used to have income averaging in the tax system uh, when we had a tax reform in the, in the 1990s. Uh, uh, that uh, flattened out the tax structure for people. Income averaging went by the boards, and for a while it wasn't as big a concern because if your marginal tax rates aren't going up very much, the fact that people who have more variable incomes for whatever reason, I mean, they could be artists who are uh, doing well one year, but perhaps not the rest of the time. Uh, athletes, uh, there are lots of people who kind of have big earning years and then and then much more modest earning years. Uh, it didn't matter as much with the tax system having uh, gotten more flattened out. But now we're back to a more steeply graduated tax system. And if you're a senior, uh, you've got OAS clawbacks to think about as well. So your marginal tax rate in retirement can be quite high. So I made the point earlier about somebody who has an indexed annuity uh, from, say, a defined benefit pension plan. Uh, that person is going to have level payments throughout their life. Uh, and and you, if you have somebody who's got... Uh, the sort of front-loaded withdrawal pattern that the RIFs uh, currently force you to do, uh, you're going to be withdrawing a lot of money at the beginning and then much less money later on. If you compare the cumulative lifetime income of these two people, the person in the defined benefit plan might have considerably higher uh, cumulative lifetime income, but they'll, their tax uh, situation isn't going to change uh, because they're always going to be having that same drawdown. Uh, whereas the person in the RIF could possibly have much higher drawdowns at the beginning and get taxed more on those and then less uh, later on. Uh, and so you could end up with a situation where their lifetime tax burdens are, are quite different. So it's a way, it's another way of just making the point that I did earlier about what the what the pattern of these annuities looks like. Uh, if you're if, if somebody were to say, we should have these RIF drawdowns uh, mandatory so that there are these big drawdowns early on because we want people to get hit by the OAS clawback. I'd say, well, hang on a minute. How is that fair? If they were going to get a level amount throughout the rest of their life and it was below the threshold for the OAS clawback, then why is it better to force them to take it in this lumpier fashion, which exposes them to the clawback? It just doesn't make any sense. So I'm, I'm not very sympathetic to the arguments uh, about you know, why the, why the government should should get its uh, take, especially not 
if the mechanism by which they're doing it is 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 potentially exposing people to these higher tax payments when a more level uh, uh, structure and and a similar lifetime income wouldn't expose them to those tax payments. It just doesn't make sense. It's not fair. So what's the flip side to recommending mandatory RIF withdrawals shrink or disappear? Uh, you mean in terms of what people would argue against it? Right, because if, if we're yep. going to be pro for something, we need to understand what the negatives are too. Yeah. Well, I think the uh, the, the the main argument against it is the one that I made already uh, or I mentioned already, which is uh, what the government itself has said, which these funds are there for your use in retirement income, and therefore we're going to make you take them into income. Uh, and there's a certain logic to that if you think of the ability to tax, uh, to, to defer tax on your savings as uh, some kind of privilege that the government grants you. Uh, and I suppose the people who are in a defined benefit pension plan of the kind that I'm talking about would say, well, you know, that payment stops when you die. So, uh, or, you know, you might have survivor benefits, but in principle, it's not supposed to leave anything over. So why, why not uh, 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 force people into the same situation? And my 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 objection there is that they're not in the same situation. It's and it, even leaving aside the fact that if you've got a taxpayer backed pension, you're in a somewhat different situation than if you're living off your own resources. I just don't think it's uh, reasonable to have the rifts uh, set up the way that they currently are. Another argument that gets made is that there are other vehicles that people can save, and if they're forced to draw down from their rift, yes, they get hit by the taxes, uh, but it's not like they're forced to spend the money. It's not like the money just disappears. Uh, they could put it even into another tax deferred ve- or a tax uh, preferred vehicle like a TFSA. That's true. Um, but uh, I go back to what I said right at the beginning about tax planning and financial engineering when you're into your 90s. Um, I don't want myself to be making those types of decisions in, in my 90s. Uh, I don't want my kids to be forced to deal with that. Uh, fi- older people are more susceptible to financial scams. We know that is just not a good time of life to be making these decisions. So why force people into them? So again, I think the I I, I understand the uh, objection. Um, the the other thing that I guess is worth saying, just by way of uh, recapping the arguments on the other side, is for many people this drawdown schedule kind of does make sense. Um, you know, on average, it's not going to be that bad a thing. The the difficulty is that uh, uh, people do differ quite a bit. Interesting example came out of the United States. They, like us, uh, did uh, allow people to uh, escape their required minimum distributions after the the financial crisis of 2007-2008. And some people did and some people didn't. The interesting thing is the people that did reduce their distributions compared to what they would have had to do otherwise. Uh, going back and looking a few years later, uh, they actually tended to live longer. So people people actually understand their situations quite well, or at least their behavior is sort of consistent in that respect. So there would be people who would take advantage of the lower distributions, and maybe they'll be the people who will end up needing the money for longer. I think we, uh, you know, we've got this kind of one-size-fits-all system right now that Uh, just doesn't uh, accommodate how diverse the population is and how different people's wants and needs in retirement are likely to be. So you point out uh, as well, uh, you and uh, Alexandre Laurent, who who wrote this report, that periodic changes are rare and and reviews might be inadequate. What would a a more regular and rigorous review regimen look like? Well, here you got this trade-off between uh, trying to stay current with what's happening with life expectancies and yields on the one hand, and, and not having a system that just feels unstable and, and makes tax planning uh, very difficult on the other. So um, I in, in principle, I think from a sort of efficiency point of view, you could make a case for a system that uh, was updated on an annual basis uh, and it looked at life expectancies, it looked on at returns on safe assets. Uh, a sophisticated way of doing it would be to tie it to annuity pricing because annuities are going to reflect these things as well, how long people are likely to live and what the returns are on the type of assets that are sensible to back that kind of a promise with. The difficulty with that is that from one year to the next, uh, you're not going to have a, a good idea of where the thing may go. So uh, realistically, I think we need to come up with something that's a little bit less uh, 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 prone to adjustment on the fly. 
And one way that you could do that with respect to the ages at which people have to stop saving and have to start drawing the saving down is just establish an annual schedule for a while. Uh, it could go up by six months uh, per year for a few years. It could go up by a year uh, uh, periodically for uh, the next little while. And that would be something that people could factor into their decisions and uh, and, and make allowances for. Um, the other problem with doing it on a on a on a regular basis is, you know, governments are capricious. If something's always up for grabs, you never know when somebody's going to come along and say, well, anybody who has tax deferred saving is by definition rich. And so therefore we're going to, uh, you know, uh, do something that's unfavorable to them. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's tempting to have this more regular kind of review, uh, but there are important objections to that. And it's probably better to go to some kind of a formula. One other thing that we haven't talked about uh, is something that we raise as a possibility in the paper, but uh, I'm happy to say right now that as we raise as a possibility, we're not wedded to a particular formula for it. And that would be have some kind of a threshold amount for the withdrawals from RIFs below which uh, you don't need to make a withdrawal. And you could think about that in two different ways. It could be that when you do your calculation, if it's below, say, 8500 bucks that you were going to have to withdraw, well, that signifies that your your RIF has been drawn down to a level where uh, maybe you ought not to be forced to draw it down further. Another way of thinking about the same thing would be to say, okay, we've got this required amount. Suppose it's going to be like 5% for the year, but then you could subtract a threshold amount from that, uh, and that wouldn't change over time. Um, that has one potentially nice feature, might make it easier to sell to people who are really focused on redistribution, which is um, for the people who have larger amounts of tax deferred saving, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any difference or it makes only a small difference. But for the people who have smaller amounts and who, who are getting closer to depletion, uh, it makes more of a difference. So perhaps that's a, another way of kind of threading that needle between the people who would say, who would agree with, let's just get rid of it all. Uh, let people set their own course. Double taxing savings a bad idea in the first place. So uh, we should have these vehicles be more open and flexible versus the people who really want the government to squeeze every penny out. Uh, if we have to, as a matter of political reality, thread, you know, navigate that somehow, maybe that threshold for where minimum withdrawals don't have to happen, it would be one way of kind of accommodating that. Do you get the sense that policymakers understand these issues and are willing to address them? Well, one of the things that allows me to say yes to that question is that we have seen temporary accommodations when the market fell uh, really abruptly. We saw the changes in 2015. And right now, uh, the Department of Finance, the F Finance Canada is looking at potential changes to RIFs because of a private member's motion uh, asking them to do it. So there's certainly a sense in which they are aware of it. Um, unfortunately, though, they're not in the same boat. Uh, you know, I, I've often thought that if we abolished all the federal government's employee pension plans, and I'd be happy to see them paid far more in current salary to compensate them, because in terms of overall compensation, I don't think it's that far out of line with what makes sense. But it's it's way too heavily tilted towards pension. And they do have these pensions that are far more generous than what anybody else is even allowed to have. If you were to put them into RRSPs, I have a feeling that we would see these rules change faster. I think the limits would go up. I think the ages at which we have to stop saving would go up. And I think that probably the minimum withdrawals would change as well. It does make a difference if you're not uh, you know, feeling feeling the pressure because the fear of running out of money in, in your old age is one that is uh, extremely uh, anxiety-inducing for people for obvious reasons. And there's one segment of the population that does not have that anxiety, and they are the people that make the rules. All right, Bill, uh, last question to you. In light of the title of this report, can you even do the the Vulcan uh, hands gesture? Do, do, have you got that one down? If I could if I could do it easily, then perhaps it wouldn't have been as persuasive a title, but we did uh, stick a question mark into that title. Uh, because uh, everybody wants to live long and prosper, and these RIF rules kind of make it hard to do both. Bill, thank you so much for your time and insight today. Thank you. Bill Robson is the CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute, and with Alexandra Laura, co-authored Live Long and Prosper, Mandatory RIF Drawdowns Raise the Risk of Outliving Tax-Deferred Saving. Read it at cdhow.org. 
Still to come from the Institute, June 8th, it's the Director's Dinner with Tiff Macklem, Governor of the Bank of Canada. It's the Institute's annual event for discussion of major policy issues among Canadian business and thought leaders. Go to the website to register for this incredible evening. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.